should be able to uh, take control here. There we go. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk you through uh, uh, a discussion that you will find uh, in the Defense Academy if you if you wish to reference it on the importance of self-reliance. And it's essentially uh, this. If you ever become the target of a violent attack, um, as you see here, reason, emotion, compassion, strong language are not going to protect you. The police won't protect you because they won't be there. Okay? And this is no uh, no disrespect and no lack of recognition for uh, for their intent and their abilities. Their presence deters and prevents crime, you know, on a on a constant basis. Uh, their presence is essential to the rule of law in a civilized society, but what they do is respond after the fact. Uh, they will very, very unlikely, uh, it's very unlikely that they will be there at the point of contact. What will protect you is violence or a credible threat of violence justly and precisely applied by you, associates, the people present uh, at, the, at the point of contact. Resolve will not be enough if you lack the means. Unarmed self-defense, pepper spray, impact weapons, edged weapons, stun guns, all of that are unlikely to succeed for the simple reason that they all require a close proximity to your attacker and therefore they're not going to work for you unless you have an advantage in skill, speed, and strength, which is something that most of us uh, cannot depend on. The people who would wish to do your harm Typically, they're strong, fast, they're more acclimated to giving and receiving violence than most of us are. They're utterly concerned and uninhibited about inflicting physical and emotional damage. They'll plan and rely upon speed, surprise, and aggression to overcome your resistance because they know how easy it is to get hurt badly in anything that's remotely approaching a fair fight. Uh, that is a, an enormous advantage uh, in a... Uh, in a violent encounter, and it's an advantage that will generally be held by your adversaries. To overcome all these natural advantages, you need a firearm immediately available. That means not locked up in your car or in your safe. You'll need the skill to use it effectively under extreme stress. You will need the will to act immediately and decisively, which includes the will and the ability to kill or wound another human being despite all your programming and, and values that inhibit you from doing so. It will be necessary for you to be vigilant, which means maintaining situ situational awareness and the ability to recognize uh, the indicators of trouble before they uh, confront you. You must have the ability to make sound decisions under pressure execute those decisions, whether they involve shooting or not. And in many, many cases, if you are prepared and vigilant and anticipate trouble, um, you may save yourself that necessity and all of the, the unpleasant consequences that follow. We know from our historical experience in America in the last several decades that untrained people sometimes manage in these situations. Uh, we have case after case of individuals with concealed carry permits and firearms on their person or firearms available in the home who do successfully protect themselves. But there are also cases of, uh, of tragedy uh, that result from people who have the means and have the intent and the will but they lack uh, the necessary training to prevail. And so the question we ask is should you rely for your safety or your family's safety on chance and hope? Uh, one of my uh, one of my mentors was fond of repeating the question uh, whether you consider hope to be an effective strategy and I would have to say no I don't believe I, I don't believe it is so let's talk a little bit now about uh, uh, an example that brings some of these things to bear uh, our emphasis this week as we as we continue to talk about self-reliance and, and individual readiness and preparedness we're going to talk about home invasions a home invasion is a term normally uh, defined as an illegal and forceful entry to an occupied private dwelling with intent to commit a violent crime.
Mike, I seem to have uh, lost control of the screen here. Oh, Mike, you there? Excuse me, folks, technical difficulties. Bill? Yeah. Please try again. See another cursor on the screen, and I'm uh, unable to. Let me try one more thing. There you go. back on track. Yes. Regarding home invasions, uh, if you look at the FBI's uh, annual compilation of crime statistics, you'll see that uh, the FBI does not does not recognize home invasion as a category. They classify incidents by the nature of the crime, not by its location. So what we refer to as a home invasion uh, may very well turn up in the crime stati statistics as a robbery, robbery within a residence. Now robbery is the taking or attempting to take anything of value from the care, custody, or control of a person or persons by force or threat of force or violence and or by putting the victim in fear. This is the Bureau's definition. In 2012, according to the FBI, there were nearly 50,000 robberies that took place in the home, about 17% of the total. This would be bad enough if a robbery were the worst of it, but it's not. Um, this is an example of the sort of threat which is, uh, even in spite of those numbers, 50,000 a year, it may be relatively low in terms of the probability of occurrence, but the consequences uh, can range from merely bad to, to truly horrific, and we will illustrate that here with a discussion of a recent historical example. And we're going to talk about the Pettit family in Connecticut in 2007. This is one of the most uh, horrific recent examples of a home invasion, which, uh, which occurred in, in Cheshire, Connecticut in 2007 when two parolees, uh, as you see, Komisaryevsky, who both lived in the community, uh, had conducted some fairly extensive surveillance uh, and target selection. They, they targeted the Pettit family um, for a home invasion. They claimed later that their original intent was, in fact, a uh, simple robbery. Uh, they arrived in the, uh, in the early morning hours, and they found Dr. Pettit asleep on a couch on his porch, um, beat him severely with a baseball bat, uh, took him down to the basement, tied him to a chair. They bound uh, Dr. Pettit's wife and his two daughters in their rooms and searched the house, but uh, they were unsatisfied with what they found there. Found a bank book that indicated a substantial balance, so uh, an hour or two after their arrival, Commissar Yevsky uh, drove Mrs. Pettit to the bank uh, as soon as it opened. And while he was out, he stopped and uh, filled two gas cans with gasoline. And he sent Mrs. Pettit into the bank alone, where she withdrew $15,000 in cash. Uh, she informed the teller that her family was being held hostage in their home. The teller made a 911 call to police as, uh, as she returned to the car uh, where Commissar Yevsky was waiting for her. The police responded immediately, but their response was simply to throw a perimeter up around the Pettit's neighborhood, which occurred after they had already returned to the home. The police remained on that perimeter for 30 minutes, making no attempt to intervene, um, making no attempt to even make the assailants aware of their presence. And in the next 30 minutes, some terrible things occurred. 
Uh, the two uh, assailants raped and strangled Mrs. Pettit, raped her 11-year-old daughter, uh, doused all three bound females in gasoline and set them on fire. Um, the, the, three, uh, the three women are supposed, presumed to have died of smoke inhalation. Mr. Pettit, in the meantime, he had uh, he'd been able to escape from his bonds in the basement, but he was severely injured, unprepared, had no means of resistance. Uh, so he fled to a neighbor's house to, uh, to call on police. Um, the assailants fled the scene, leaving the fire behind, uh, and were caught by police uh, on the perimeter one block away. The home invasion in total had lasted uh, nearly seven hours. Let's talk a little bit about uh, lessons learned. This crime was planned in a systematic fashion with surveillance of the home and its occupants. It was not uh, a, a, an impulse crime by any means. It was not, uh, uh, it was not planned with any, any lack of, uh, of, uh, of rationality and deliberation. So the question we ask is this. Could those two men have been observed at any point while they were conducting their surveillance? Uh, if this were you rather than the Pettits, would you notice your home being observed? Would you notice your vehicle being followed by strangers? Or does, as is the case with most of us, does your normalcy bias and inattention to your surroundings place you in as much risk as, as they were? Most threats, uh, and, and not, just, not just these criminal threats by one or two uh, bad actors, but most threats are most vulnerable in their planning and preparation phase, and the ability to to detect um, those those planning actions, the surveillance, the preparation, the staging, the approach, is is far and away a superior form of defense. Uh, but of course, in this case, that turned out not to be the case. The home was not secured. These gentlemen walked onto the porch and into the home through unlocked doors, caught Mr. Pettit asleep on his porch and allowed the entire family to come under their control without any warning. Now, had they been required to make a forcible entry or trigger alarms, had they had to come through a locked or hardened door or break a window to enter the home, um, there's a very strong probability the family would have been alerted uh, and they would have had time to flee or to respond in some fashion, uh, but that did not occur here. The family was, as we said, it, they were surprised and, and capable of resistance, but in, but in the Pettit's case, unfortunately, there were no firearms in the home. No one, had, no one in the family had trained to defend themselves against a violent threat. So, you know, as I said a little while ago, uh, even if you are alert to the danger and you have the resolve to resist and protect yourself and your family, if you do not have the means or the ability, um, you are unlikely to succeed. In this case, unlike most violent attacks, police were informed in time to intervene, but they followed their procedures and failed to intervene in time to, to save lives. Now, most home invasions, like, like most other violent crimes, occur with a far slower police response, uh, or no police response at all. You cannot count on the police to defend you in a situation like this. So our question is, is there a larger lesson on the importance of self-reliance that we can draw from this? And I think it's rather self-evidently true that. So now we'll move on and talk about a, uh, a hypothetical scenario. Uh, this scenario is constructed to illustrate a, a somewhat similar event, how it might develop. We'll focus on, uh, on certain uh, stop points or decision points in, in, in the course of this narrative on the decision process of the homeowner, on the capabilities and limitations that essentially predetermine the outcome. We'll use a variation of the tactical decision game format so that we will focus on, on critical decision points along the timeline uh, and consider how things might have gone differently had the family been better prepared. Now, all of the concepts and skills that we'll talk about, um, especially in the, uh, in, the, in the second consideration of this scenario, uh, 
are things that we address and training that we offer uh, at Pulse Firearms. All right, our protagonists, Robert and Claire, live with their two daughters in a, in a one and a half story suburban home. Uh, the diagram, you know, is a uh, is a, a spare rendering of the floor plan. Uh, the shaded portion portion is the first floor, which of course extends out to the entire footprint of the house, uh, and you see the uh, the layout of the upper floor. Um, they do not have an alarm system. Their exterior doors are standard residential construction, metal clad with a deadbolt. Uh, windows are uh, standard double pane casement style. Robert, in fact, owns a handgun, a 9mm Glock, which he purchased at the recommendation of a friend who has taken him to the range. He's, uh, he's shot well and he shoots and he handles his pistol well. He understands its operation. He shoots well at uh, ranges up to 7 to 10 yards on a square range in the daylight at paper targets. At night, he keeps his pistol loaded with a trigger lock installed in the drawer of his nightstand over Claire's objection because uh, Claire has not grown up around guns. She's uncomfortable with them. She's never fired one and she doesn't like having one in the house um, um, near their children. So at 3 a.m. on the morning in question, Robert and Claire wake up to the sound of a, of a series of heavy blows and, and the splintering of wood on the ground floor. You know, Claire asks him what's happening. He doesn't know. Um, advises her to stay where she is while he recovers his pistol, uh, fumbles for a while with the trigger lock, uh, unlocks his pistol, and moves towards the bedroom door. The house is dark, uh, the first floor especially. Looking out through his um, uh, through his uh, his door, he sees no activity, but he can hear voices and footsteps and other noise from downstairs. He reaches out for the hall light switch that controls the lights, but he realizes that if he flips that light on, he will illuminate the hallway and himself and and uh, illuminate him, illuminate himself more clearly than he will anyone on the first floor. So he refrains from. He still hasn't seen anyone, but he hears footsteps coming up the stairs, and so he leans out around the corner and shouts, Stop, I have a gun, which is the cue for gunfire, which erupts from the darkened first floor. He sees bright muzzle flashes. He hears the reports of a firearm. The door frame splinters next to him, and he feels a blow to his upper right arm. He stumbles back into his bedroom. He's, uh, he's able to catch the weapon as it falls from his, uh, from his right hand. And the man coming up the stairs reaches the landing outside his door, turns, shoots several more rounds into the darkened bedroom. Uh, Robert is, uh, you know, he, he stumbles off to his left out of the line of fire, as you see on the diagram. Uh, his wife is across the room from him, or, or so, he, so he thinks and believes. Um, he, he hears more shot, hears and sees and feels more shots fired from the hallway, but they're apparently unaimed. Uh, he hears another set of footsteps coming up the stairs, and he hears someone say, get at which exclusion he realizes that his daughters have been screaming from their bedroom uh, since things got loud uh, just a little while ago. The screaming down the hall from his, his uh, kid's bedroom increases and then it's replaced with cries and whimpers after a series of sharp uh, slapping impacts. The individual out outside his door yells, we've got your kids, asshole. Now do what we say if you don't want them to get hurt. So Robert now faces something of a dilemma. He's wounded. His right arm is useless and bleeding. He's still armed, but, but he's never shot left-handed. He wouldn't dare shoot down the hall anyway because that's where the kids' room is and he doesn't know where the, where the girls are. For that matter, he has no target. He hasn't even seen the assailant since all of this started. So we'll stop the narrative here. Um, we don't need to go any further. 
the questions that this simple scenario poses are these. How many people have not made basic physical security upgrades to their home? Is your home as easy to enter in the middle of the night for a stranger as the Pettits was or as Roberts and Claire's was in this scenario? How many people have no firearms in their home? How many people have guns but they keep them secured, unloaded, and out of reach? How many have overindulged in buying guns and ammunition and tactical accessories, but have not trained? How many are comforted by the proximity of a loaded pistol in the nightstand, uh, treating it like a talisman against evil that they don't even know how to use? And finally, and very importantly, uh, even if you have positive answers to all the above questions, how many people have never thought or talked or walked their way through a scenario like this because it's so hypothetical and it's too scary to contemplate it'll never happen to them or because they simply lack the tools to to break down a scenario like this and to plan and train and prepare to win it so what we'll do now is we'll rewind back to the beginning uh, in fact, before the beginning of the scenario, and we'll consider how, how proper training and planning and mental preparation might uh, avert uh, the bad ending that we saw. So now, on our alternate timeline, Robert and Claire in their home uh, have a somewhat different situation. Their windows and doors are alarmed. Their alarm system provides automatic notification to the alarm company and through them to the police as well as a piercing audible alarm in the house. Their exterior doors are solid hardwood in reinforced frames with two long throw commercial grade security deadbolts on each door. Their casement windows are equipped with security locks and with a security film laminate which, uh, which makes it hard to shatter and, and remove the glass uh, uh, quickly. Now this home's not a fortress as, as none of our homes are nor should we want them to be. But unauthorized entry is going to take time, it's going to make a lot of noise, it's going to alert the occupants, and if the phone line is operable, uh, it will notify the police within uh, minutes of the beginning of a, a break-in. Well, Robert and Claire each have 9mm semi-automatic pistols, and they've trained. They've trained in these key areas. They've trained in situational awareness, which uh, which we define briefly as the ability to recognize and to respond without denial, without hesitation, to threat indicators. It means that they live in what Colonel Jeff Cooper called color code yellow, the relaxed awareness uh, that, that leaves us um, ready to recognize those threat indicate, indicators when they first appear. They've trained in basic techniques including stance, grip, combative sighted fire, movement, communications, the use of tactical weapons mounted lights, and, and many, many more, um, all of which roll up into the ability to place rapid, accurate fire on targets that need to be shot. They've trained in what we at Pulse call the task triad, which consists of three elements to support each other, and all three of which are, are essential. When we speak of stress-resistant skills, we're talking about the ability to apply these basic techniques, even under stress, at an acceptable level of performance, without conscious thought, in a way that allows you to maintain your situational awareness, prevents tunnel vision and auditory exclusion, prevents fixation on the first or the most obvious threat, and buys time for critical decision-making. Stress inoculation refers to the way that the average person's ability to function mentally and physically deteriorates very quickly and very dramatically the, the more they are stressed um, by the immediate experience. And finally, when we speak of being killing enabled, we're speaking of how the wheels fall off for the average person during a lethal force encounter. If you lack the will to instantly and ruthlessly inflict violence on your adversary, then all your other skills and knowledge and experience will be useless. You must learn, and you learn by training, to overcome what is for most of us a natural aversion to killing or harming others. 
you must be in control of that switch. And those last two elements, stress inoculation and, and becoming killing enabled, you cannot learn those on a live fire range. You will only learn them through quality, reality-based training. And then finally, Robert and Claire have planned and rehearsed their response to a threat in the home, bringing all of those above elements to bear. So, uh, in a little while, Ron will talk to you in, in, in more, uh, much more substantial detail about how we approach these concepts uh, for training. But let's move on now with our scenario. During the day, while they're at home, Robert and Claire keep their pistols either loaded and ready and holstered on their persons, or hidden but accessible in a safe in the rooms they occupy, ensuring easy access for themselves from any point in the house. The children have been introduced to firearms. They've trained under the NRA Eddie, Eddie Eagle uh, safety training program. They've learned never to touch a firearm without their parents' permission and to report the presence of a firearm immediately to an adult. Uh, guns have no uh, mystique or magic. They respect the guns, but they do not fear them, and they've never broken the rules. So tonight, at 3 o'clock in the morning, Robert is awakened by several muffled impacts from the first floor, followed about a minute or so later by the sound of glass breaking and the shrieking of his audible alarm. The noise of breaking glass continues for some time, accompanied by, uh, by swearing. The kids are awake and call out, and Robert tells them to stay, stay where they are, just like we practiced. Robert and Claire retrieve their handguns, which now have weapon lights mounted from their nightstands. Claire grabs her cell phone, they move according to their plan. Robert moves to the door. You see the, um, the, the darker of the two figures in our diagram. He triggers the momentary switch on his weapon light and slices the pie, scanning all visible portions of the first floor, leaning out for a quick look down the stairs. He sees nothing illuminated by his light, but he continues to hear noise from the back of the house. As soon as Claire move, jumps or, or moves and joins him, she bumps him gently from behind, and he says, move. They move together down the hall, Claire in the lead, hugging the wall as far away as they can get from the, uh, the rail that looks over into the first floor. Robert fo follows close behind her, his weapon at a compressed low ready, ready to trigger his light and acquire a target on any visual or, or audible cue. They reach the kids' room. Claire moves the girls into the rear corner, as you see on the diagram. She picks up the uh, telephone extension in that room, and the line is dead. She dials, dials 911 on her cell phone, gives a quick report to the dispatcher, uh, leaves the line open, drops the phone into the pocket of her robe. Robert takes up a position left of the doorway. Again, as you see on the diagram, he's watching and listening. He reaches out through the door and he switches on the downstairs sconced lights, which illuminate the first floor living room without casting light up into the uh, upstairs hallway or, or doorways. Once the girls are in place, Claire moves across the room to the opposite corner where she has a clear view all the way down the hall. She takes up a brace kneeling position against the bookshelf. She and Robert both are comfortable with her having a line of fire only a couple of feet to the right of her husband because they've trained for this in reality-based training and on the live fire range. Robert knows not to break the plane of the doorway and to keep his muzzle inside the threshold. From that position, he has a clear view of the bottom half of the stairs. And now Robert and Claire have control of the situation. No one can climb the stairs without being detected. Their own positions are undetected and not exposed to observation or to fire from any point lower than the staircase. Claire covers the landing at the top of the stairs as a backup in case anyone gets past uh, Robert. And we'll end our 
second uh, iteration of the scenario here. We don't need to play this out any further. From this situation, if police response is swift, cell phone communications through the dispatcher will allow them to uh, confirm their position and situation to the police. In the interim, because as we know, this response may take a while, Robert and Claire can challenge the intruders verbally if and when they choose. They can make informed, legally justifiable decisions to shoot uh, if the threat continues to advance and if the threat meets the criteria for the use of deadly force. Bottom line is they are now in control of the situation. They and their family are safe. Mike, if you'll hand this over to Ron for a discussion of uh, training inputs. Thank you, Bill. Um, I will do so. Ron, let me hand yep. off can the control to you. I uh, sure can. Great. Okay, Ron, you should be good to go there. I think I am. Uh, there is a lot that went into that uh, scenario, a lot of planning that went into that scenario for the successful outcome uh, that uh, really does uh, take a, a little bit of effort to achieve. Um, if you should choose to work with Pulse, train with Pulse, read our materials, uh, you'll see that we approach training a little bit differently than most organizations do. Uh, when you uh, work with us, you're going to get a whole host of uh, information uh, before you ever even get to us. Um, many schools won't allow you to take the curricula they have out of their uh, facilities. Um, and uh, we believe very strongly you have to have this information out front. So uh, what I'm going to do really quickly here is just kind of walk you through uh, some of the resources we have and um, in the presentation itself uh, we have uh, these specific references uh, that I'd like to kind of show you the uh, links to in the background inside the Defense Academy. Um, let's see here. Just a second. To, uh, Mike, I'm not able to access that uh, show screen. Yeah, I hope, I'll need to change you and make you presenter. Okay. Hold on one second, please. All right. Uh, while we're waiting on this, um, you should there we go. To go there. Got it. Uh, so, once you're inside the Defense Academy and you have your free 14-day trial, uh, navigation is fairly easy. What I'm going to be taking you to here. Uh, can you see my screen? All right, Mike. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, navigation is very easy. You'll get in there. You'll have the access and you'll uh, access this manual, the individual tactics manual, just by coming over here by the content tab. You'll see the manuals plus videos and you'll just follow that down and where we're at right now is the uh, individual tactics manual. It is a rather uh, long, uh, large uh, section as you can see just by the headings here um, uh, that will walk you through all those individual tactics that went into making that a successful outcome in, in that last uh, scenario that Bill explained to you. Uh, inside the tactics manual we get pretty deep into uh, describing uh, the house, the way houses are laid out, the way to think uh, tactically in your home, uh, some key ideas that you want to keep in mind uh, as uh, you uh, start securing your house and you start making your defensive plan. Um, in the in this uh, scenario that we had, we also saw what we call micro-team uh, tactics uh, being employed by two individuals. Um, and then we have the team tactics manual in here for you. Uh, you can go through all of that information uh, as well. And we'll show you in that in the individual tactics then how to use that to clear out your home with these techniques, uh, how to do things like slicing the pie, uh, which is just taking ever-increasing larger uh, views around corner as you clear that corner, uh, the specific techniques to use, how to use them and how to do them well. Uh, we'll show you how to in there, to not just pie around corners, but how to actually 
you know, clear hallways, how to clear intersections, two-way, four-way intersections, etc. Um, and then in the team tactics, uh, we uh, introduced to you the sphere of influence, uh, how that uh, matters to you, for instance, your personal security bubble, why that's important, uh, how you can extend your sphere of influence is just by being able to control a situation uh, that is within your grasp to control to your weapons, weapons maximum uh, extent of being able to reach out and uh, deal within a, a given effective given area. Uh, and then, of course, we have the handgun drills. If you uh, the different weapon drills manuals that we have, we have the handgun, the rifle, and the shotgun. Uh, when you go into these manuals, the handgun drill manuals, for instance, uh, you can go in, uh, you can click on a chapter to get to that chapter, as I'm doing here now. And then you'll see that inside here we have the uh, a very brief video describing the skill, and then we go into great detail. Uh, about how that skill will be used, uh, how to do it correctly, uh, what it can look like, uh, what sometimes it should look like, and how to make these things work for you. And you have this early access, and what this allows you to do if you do decide to take training with Pulse is it lays that intellectual foundation for you so you have an idea of what's happening before you ever get to the class. When you do take a class with us, we don't spend any time in the classroom uh, all that time is spent on the range with you and your firearm working working that firearm uh, working those stress resistance skills that we uh, discuss here in the uh, drills manuals and then as importantly uh, when you do go home we leave you with a, uh, a link to your post course training that allows you then to brush up on those skills that you've been practicing and then also you still have access to the Defense Academy, and if you're ever wondering, wow, what was that thing I learned, you can come right back in here, uh, come back into the contents, the videos, the manuals, hit the whatever it is you were wanting to get brushed up on that. Um, so that really does it uh, for the training aspect of it. Uh, we obviously welcome all your questions about that, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this over to... Mike, so he can uh, finish up with the uh, any questions we may have in the closing of the uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Ron. Um, 